In Psalm 95, God says regarding the Israelites, For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, They are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, They shall never enter my rest. What does it mean to be unable to enter God's rest? Does this relate to keeping the Sabbath? Does it mean he'll shut off my cable Sunday afternoon so I can't watch football? While he could do that, not entering his rest, which means being unable to gain his ultimate blessings, is a huge punishment. Today's sermon is the second installment in our Resting in the Lord series. We will see a connection between resting in the Lord and having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's worship God. Generation 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are so grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. We pray you will bring more volunteers. We continue to pray for those overseeing and working at the thrift shop. Our pastor and wife are vacationing in Europe. We praise you for safe travels, pray for a wonderful time enjoying that part of your creation and each other, and pray you will bring them home safely. Two students were admitted by lottery to the Western Center Academy for next year. We praise you. A member is scheduled to have her hip replaced next week. We pray for the operation to take place, for a successful surgery, and a swift, complete recovery. Lord, we praise you for sending your Son to us and the sacrifice he made so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. Thirty students at the local art school have contracted COVID. The campus is closed. We pray for mild symptoms, quick recoveries, that the infection will not spread, and for minimal disruption to the conclusion of the semester. A former pastor is on beta blockers for an irregular heartbeat. We pray for his heart to return to normal rhythm and strength. A relative is still battling brain cancer. The latest MRI shows the cancer is still present following treatment. She has five children and had brain surgery in 2020. We pray for additional treatment to bring about a complete cure. We lift up a daughter and a grandson who recently suffered from emotional problems. We pray for you as the great physician to restore their mental health. The caretaker of the daughter of a longtime member has aggressive breast cancer. She is in her third month of a three-month chemo regimen and has heart valve issues. We pray for her body to accept the chemo and that this treatment is successful. We pray for the year of infusions to be successful and for you as the great physician to bring peace, healing, and restoration to full health. We lift up a missionary and daughter-in-law who is battling breast and bone cancer and is now on hospice. We pray for you to bring peace and comfort to her, her family, and her friends. A longtime visitor and church supporter has pancreatic cancer. We pray for you as the great physician to bring about healing, wholeness, and restoration. We lift up the country of Ukraine. We pray for the attacks on civilians to cease immediately, for the hostilities between Russia and Ukraine to end as soon as possible, and for a lasting peace to be negotiated. We praise you for countries, churches, organizations, and missionaries who are assisting the refugees. We lift up the local art school. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you, and love you more deeply. We pray for families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for your wisdom, discernment, compassion, love, and integrity on our leaders and that they would guide this nation according to your will, returning us to the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. We pray for revival in this world. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your Son to be drawn nearer and nearer to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. And we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Pastor Charles Stanley included the following in the foreword to the Oswald Chambers classic, My Utmost for His Highest. With the exception of the Bible, no book has had as profound an effect on my life as My Utmost for His Highest. It was here that God impressed on my heart that precious truth, essential to the life of every believer who truly desires to follow Christ. The most important aspect of the Christian life is our personal relationship with Christ. How does one create and grow a personal relationship with Christ? A large part of the answer is to routinely rest in Him, to gain His spirit and peace of mind. When we choose to, Rest in the form of a pause is beneficial to our productivity and our well-being. Sometimes we don't have a choice but to rest. Have you ever been so totally exhausted that you were so tired you not only needed rest, but really had no choice but to rest? I discovered Idlewild when I learned to rock climb back in the 1980s. One day my partner and I were climbing the Swallow on Tokwitz Rock. I ended up in the lead most of the day, and there was some challenge to protecting the route, both for me and my partner. It took all my physical strength and mental focus to finish that day. Though likely named for a bird, the swallow swallowed all my energy, and then some. In fact, I was in a daze most of the following day. I just sat in front of the TV, staring at it. My dad checked in on me in the morning. He asked if I was okay. I said I was, wondering why he asked. Without moving, I sat in the same place into the afternoon. My dad checked on me again. When he asked a second time if I was all right, I began to wonder why he was concerned. Then I realized it was afternoon, and I couldn't remember anything that happened earlier that day. The TV had been on the whole time, but I couldn't remember a single show I'd seen. To my dad, I probably looked catatonic, after a little thought, I realized why I was in a stupor. The swallow taxed me to the point that I needed a day to recover. I had neither the energy nor desire to move at all. But this isn't the rest we're talking about today. God doesn't need this kind of rest ever. But he is very serious about us resting or pausing in him. In the Bible, rest typically means one of two things freedom from activity or labor, or peace of mind or spirit. So there is a physical meaning, freedom from activity, and a spiritual mental meaning, peace of mind or spirit. Today, we will continue to look at rest with an emphasis on peace of mind or spirit. Last time, from scriptures in the Old Testament, we learned that God is very serious about Sabbath rest. He paused after creating the universe and wanted the Israelites to pause on the seventh day to remember him as creator, redeemer, and the one who sanctifies. The message to us from the scriptures we studied last time in Exodus and Deuteronomy is clear. Resting in the Lord, pausing to engage in Sabbath rest, is meant to lead to a very close, very real, very intimate, very transformative relationship with God. God called the Israelites to live by three W's, work, wait, worship. They were to work six days and then on the seventh day pause to focus on him, to praise and honor him. In the first sermon, I shared that rest is so inherently good, I asked you to choose two things that are inherently good to you. Pets, dogs, even cats since Pastor Bob wasn't there and isn't here now. A mountain lake or pine forest a sunrise or sunset, to enter these in a note on your cell phone and set an alarm to remember daily that God is your creator, the one who sanctifies you and your redeemer. My two were mountains and snow. What does the New Testament say about this Sabbath rest? How does the notion of resting in the Lord change with the arrival of Jesus? First, let's look at how Jesus modified the practice of Old Testament law. From Exodus 30, 10, we learn the chief priests were to go before God annually on behalf of the Israelites to atone for their sins. 
there, was, there were also continual burnt offerings and animal sacrifices. The death, the sacrifice, of Jesus Christ ended the need for animal sacrifice and his resurrection means Jesus lives and serves today as our chief priest. Accepting him as Lord and Savior makes Old Testament style atonement and sacrifice obsolete. In Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The phrase law and prophets often refers to the entire Old Testament. In part, Jesus is saying that he has not come to do away with the authority of the Old Testament. Rather, through his perfect moral nature, he came to accomplish what was intended by that authority. Now that annual chief priest atonement and animal sacrifice no longer takes place, it may look like the law has changed or that it's no longer in effect. The truth is the law still exists and with the same intent. It's just that Jesus succeeds in following the law, something no other man could ever fully do. This means that Jesus is the completion of the plan, the fruition of the project God set into motion in the Old Testament. Believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior and following his teachings means we have a much better path to God than was available in the Old Testament. One analogy is the evolution of family camping, from using a tent to using a trailer or motorhome. The trailer or motorhome has almost all the conveniences of home. It's like you never left. The improvement over tent camping is obvious. Another analogy, the cell phone. With the old style rotary phone, all you could do was talk or leave a message. The hard line forced you to be at home or work to talk. With a cell phone, you get a mobile phone, plus texting if you don't want or need communication in real time, plus a flashlight and apps that tune your guitar, deposit your checks, etc. The motorhome is a big improvement over tent camping. The cell phone is far more versatile than the old rotary phone. In a similar way, Jesus takes the moral structure God initiated in the Old Testament and kicks it up multiple notches. Believing in Jesus and modeling our relationship with him after the one he had with the Father creates a much better method to have relationship with the Father. More direct, more straightforward, more personal. Trusting and following Jesus is a giant improvement over trying to follow Old Testament law ourselves. As is the case for the role of chief priests in the sacrificial system, as well as the entire Jewish sacrificial system itself, Jesus shows up and the notion of Sabbath rest is modified. Jesus turns things upside down for the Jews and shows those of us living 2,000 years after his death how to gain peace of mind and God's spirit. In Old Testament times, the avoidance of physical labor was a primary component to keeping the Sabbath. This allowed the Israelites to comply with the letter of the law, giving God a single day each week designed to meet the legal requirements of the law. With Jesus' arrival, emphasis was placed on the spirit of the law. The idea was to very consciously pause one's normal activity to remember God as redeemer, creator, and the one who sanctifies. With time, this practice would lead to closer relationship with God as one experienced more and more of his spirit, which would lead to increased peace of mind for the follower. Let's consider several New Testament verses that describe the modification to Sabbath rest. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Here, Paul writes that Christ has completed the work started with the Sabbath in the Old Testament. Instead of taking one day to avoid physical activity, we can have a far deeper rest, a connection to God and His Spirit. We get this rest in and through Jesus Himself every day. He is our rest. By trusting in and obeying him, we can have the rest. 
he experienced the relationship he experienced with his father. And ultimately, by the sanctification provided through rest, his spirit. We have his peace of mind. This is part of the transformation we are to experience as we trust and follow Jesus more and more closely. A study Bible offers the following with regards to Colossians 2, verse 17. Old Testament laws, holidays, and festivals pointed toward Christ. Paul calls them a shadow of the reality that was to come, Christ himself. When Christ came, he dispelled the shadow. If we have Christ, we have what we need to know and please God. Now, please don't take this to mean that since Sabbath rest becomes a more daily experience, that somehow Sunday worship is less important. Leviticus 23.3 says, There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. We are still to spend time worshiping the Lord together in assembly, and we will continue to do that every Sunday morning. Also, please don't assume that such a change between the Old and New Testaments signifies a move away from and ultimately the end of Sabbath rest. Isaiah chapter 66 verses 22 and 23 say, As the new heavens and new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me says the Lord. Sabbath rest is foundational to God's entire plan for us all, forever. It isn't going away. Back to the New Testament. Paul encourages us to move past the Old Testament notion of rest in Galatians 4, verses 9 through 11. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Here, this does not mean that we no longer need physical rest or a day of rest. It means that as Christians, we need a personal transformative rest in God continually, not simply celebrate special days of ritual non-activity. To go through the motions but not to engage in meaningful restorative rest is, according to Paul, backsliding. Christianity isn't a religion or ritual. It is a relationship, a close, personal relationship. Note that Paul emphasizes that it is not knowing God, but God knowing us. That having drawn us to him, we now have a greater, deeper understanding of him and the gift of rest peace of mind, and connection to him that he wants us to experience constantly, continually. Here is an analogy to understand this New Testament modification to Sabbath rest. In high school and college, I used to go snow camping every spring with some friends. This was basically backpacking in the snow. We would rent snowshoes and head up San Gorgonio Mountain. After hiking up the mountain, we'd dig a hole to get the tent out of the wind, climb inside, change into dry clothes, get into our sleeping bags, and fire up the stove, we'd melt snow to get boiling water for hot chocolate and top ramen noodles. At 9,000 feet below a mountain face, the wind often kicks up at night. Because we had dug out a level pit, we were warm, comfortable, protected. We could hear the wind, but other than the tent flapping just a little, it didn't matter that the wind chill was below zero. Yes, we were resting physically from the effort of the hike up the mountain, but we had the peace of mind that we were safe from the elements. The harder the wind blew, the more safe and secure we felt. By analogy, when the winds of life threaten to blow you around, you want the spirit and peace of mind of God to provide confidence and assurance. Christ comes and reminds the Jews that rest is far more than avoiding physical activity one day a week. Rest is about peace of mind and experiencing God's Spirit through an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In this way, Christ has come and fulfilled the Sabbath plan. A personal relationship with Jesus constitutes the close, 
real, intimate relationship God has desired since the beginning. God's rest ties to our own salvation. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 say, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their, the Israelites, example of disobedience. That is, we have the rest or peace of mind of knowing that we don't have to and shouldn't try to save ourselves. Our salvation is accomplished through Jesus. The full notion of rest, from God's point of view, includes acknowledging Him as Creator, the one who sanctifies, and our Redeemer. These New Testament verses embody resting in the Lord as God planned it from the start. Jesus says all this very succinctly in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. When he says the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around, Jesus is saying that abstaining from activity is not the goal, not the purpose of the Sabbath. The top priority is not to live by the letter of the Sabbath law. Rather, one is to engage in the Sabbath in a way that facilitates an intimate, personal, transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, Jesus announces his divinity once again in the Bible by acknowledging his lordship even over the Sabbath. Jesus is saying God's rest, our peace of mind, the inheritance of his spirit is for us and that he is our source for these things. Note that the scriptures shared here from Colossians, Galatians, Hebrews, and Mark all support God's consistent message that Sabbath rest is meant to provide us his peace of mind and spirit. Let's get real and practical. Can you really have a meaningful relationship by devoting one day of the week to it? Trying to have intimacy and worship in one day and not at all during the other six won't lead to transformation through relationship. It wouldn't work with another human being. So why would it work with God? Instead of a single day of reduced activity, how do we establish a routine, a flow of continual rest in the Lord? Especially if we have been used to a Sunday only Sabbath, how do we move to Sabbath rest that occurs daily? What must our rhythm of life look like to rest in the Lord more often than once a week? Before I retired from teaching, I pretty much worked either at my job or around the house, Monday through Saturday. Then Sunday, after church, I would fellowship with friends or watch a Christian movie in the afternoon or evening. But my primary mindset was that I was not working. It was not, how do I spend quality time with God? What if we had relationships six days a week and celebrated with assembly worship on the seventh day? That could produce continual, constant intimacy. Is there a daily activity that, you, that would stop the normal flow of the day and week and get you present with God? Is there something you could do every day, maybe just for half an hour to start, that would provide escape from work and every other potential intrusion to your God time? Spiritual journaling, perhaps? In terms of our witnessing to build God's kingdom, we should include rest as part of the good news of the gospel. Then we'll invite others into God's rest with us. Do you know someone who is pursuing happiness? Would they be interested in gaining God's joy? Happiness would naturally follow. Or do you know someone who is tired of conflict? Would they be interested in gaining God's peace? Conflict should naturally disappear. Do you know someone who needs to forgive? Would they be interested in gaining God's love? Forgiveness should be automatic when the fullness of God's love flows through you. If so, a discussion with them about accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior should be much easier to facilitate once they know the benefits of this rest are part of the package. One challenge to achieving this much transformational change is our unwillingness to trust God to do what He says He'll do. 
Can you think of two or three things that really concern you? Of course, you never worry. But if you did, these are the things that would come to mind. If you did worry about them, how long would it be before you realized you should stop worrying and simply pray about them instead? Can you trust God to take care of these things for you? My three trouble me because I cannot see them. I cannot feel them at work in my life. They are high blood pressure, the devil, and my pride. I take pills for the blood pressure, and I trust him that the medications will work. And I need to rest in the Lord to keep out the devil and to rely on God rather than too much on myself. Certainly the Israelites struggled with fully trusting God, and much more was being asked than one Sabbath day a week. The notion of weekly Sabbath rest was extended to years. Leviticus 25 verses 1 through 4 say, The Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Could the Israelites really trust God to protect them? Taking one day a week off is already hard enough. The surrounding peoples, large and in charge, had been displaced from their lands. Each Sabbath they grew food, made weapons, trained for battles with their foes, the Israelites, while the Israelites rested. Over time, wouldn't that give Israel's enemies an advantage in battle? By resting one day a week, the Israelites displayed in a very real, tangible way their trust in God, that God would be their protector, saving them from their enemies. How much more trust is needed if a year of rest is to be observed? Could you really trust the Lord not only for protection, but ensuring a year of food and drink as well? The nature of Sabbath rest has been modified by Jesus' resurrection. Whether you are an Old Testament Israelite or a 21st century Christian, participating in that rest both requires and builds trust. You must trust in God's provision if you are to rest rather than try alone to provide for yourself and your family. With practice, this trust builds, as does your confidence in God's willingness and ability to be your rock, your stronghold, your strength, your provider. Sabbath rest is foundational to a personal relationship with Jesus. When we pause to focus on God, who He is, what He has done, we remember the promises He has made and kept. We strengthen our bond with Him and experience unity with Him as He provides us His Spirit. We begin to take part in His new creation, filled with mercy and purpose. Let's pray. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Lord, we crave this rest. May we do our part to nurture a personal relationship with you. May 2022 continue to be a year in which we focus on resting in you. May we not only take the time we need to recuperate physically, but may we also seek your peace of mind, your spirit. May we trust your Son as Lord of the Sabbath, nurturing a personal relationship with Him that provides your spirit and peace of mind. May your Word fill our minds, soften our hearts, and may your Spirit guide us closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.